for giving a very illuminating talk. Now I invite uh, Dr. D. R. Sahu to chair the next talk to be delivered by Professor Joydeep Dutt. Over to Dr. Professor Sahu. Thank you, Professor Song. It is my pleasure to in, in, introduce uh, Professor Datta. He is professor in IIT Kanpur. He received his PhD degree from IIT Kharagpur. His broad area of research is optimization theory. He has over 60 research papers mm -hmm. in various reputed international journals. He is author of three important books in optimization theory. First one is Principles of Optimization Theory. Second one is Optimality Conditions in Convex Optimization. Third one is Vector Optimization, a view through variational analysis. Now, I invite Professor Datta to deliver his talk on KKT conditions for optimization problems. Professor Datta. Uh, good morning, Shahuri. Good morning. Uh, good morning. It's delightful to see you after a long time, and I would like to tell the audience that we had a delightful trip of Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. You? Uh, with you. Uh, and I wish all of the young students, uh, especially the researchers, uh, uh, happy National Mathematics Day. Uh, you should, everybody should really read the book, The Man Who Knew Infinity by Robert Kanijal, to know more about the amazing life of Srinivasa Ramanujan. And uh, today I would be uh, doing, I, I have written the slides by hand. I'm very sorry, I had to give too many conference talks actually. Uh, so I hope my handwriting is legible because I tried to make it. So I had uh, various names for this. And if uh, Professor Shom said that there will be a volume on this, so I might submit what I wrote. I think just I'll share. Is it gone? So, uh, 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 can this be seen? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So, uh, though I want to call it playing with optimality conditions, which I sometimes like, because usually when you read about optimality condition, when you become a graduate student in optimization, most of us have learned our optimization from the famous book of Bazara, Sherali, and Shetty, which is called Da Bazara in the standard money in the, in the optimization community. And so what happens is that uh, uh, it's uh, so people just know that, okay, I just have to look at problems which have you minimize effect subject to some inequality constants and equality constants. But problems in optimization can take very bizarre forms, for example, bi-level forms. So in those type of cases, how optimality conditions can come when new structures have been put into optimization problems, how will optimality conditions evolve? Because necessary optimality conditions are key. They are the first step in characterizing the problem and the first step in knowing what kind of objects are solutions and what kind of objects are not solutions. Uh, the, uh, the role of uh, KKD conditions essentially tells you either the point is not a solution or some kind of qualification condition is invalid. So I had, after writing this, I decided maybe another title to this should be an invitation to an optimization feast. If you look at the sections, they are as if you have come to have a lunch with me or a dinner with me and that kind of uh, talk. You might say that among this uh, batch of serious talks, I am giving a more popular talk. The whole key idea here is to tell the young graduate students that it is very important that if you are serious in doing research in optimization, you really have to learn non-smooth analysis very well. Because here I want to feature the centrality of non-smooth analysis in deducing con optimality conditions for various classes of optimization problems. Of course, because due to the lack of time, I won't be able to cover uh, what I had thought, so I'd reduce the number of sli slides. So, because it's very important to understand. 
So the classical model that we know is of equality constraints for which we have the Lagrange multiplier rule. And post World War II, people started looking at Lagrange multiplier rule for problems with inequality constraints. Linear programming problem is one of them. Quadratic programming problems with linear constraints or quadratic constraints is another of them. And then there's convex programming problem. And for these problems, or just we, F and G I is a differentiable, which we have Friedjohn conditions and Karush Kuntar condition. In fact, I, in 2010, in the Euro conference in uh, Lisbon, I had the rare privilege to meet Harold Kuhn. And he spoke to me for half an hour. And he told me a lot of stories about how Kuntagar conditions were actually framed. And because initially they deduced the Kuntagar condition for linear programming problem. And that they had David Gale, the famous game theorist associated with them. But then uh, he Tucker wanted to move from linear to quadratic. And Gale, who was a game theorist, said, oh, guys, come on, you do your quadratic this business. I'm just going to game, do game theory. But then... Kuhn gave Tucker the idea, why not we just think about differentiable functions. But then what happened is that Kuhn went to Santa Monica in California to run corporation for the summer. Sorry, Tucker. But Tucker caught mums there. And so they used to exchange letters. And his letters used to come in a quarantine form because Kuhn already had mums. He could actually use his letters. And to deduce the condition, it was Tucker who gave the idea of using Farkas lemma. And to the constraint qualification that you see in the original paper, nonlinear programming by Kuhn and Tucker, the, which is called the KT constraint qualification was given by Kuhn. And the interesting part of the whole thing is that um, saddle points play a very major role in their paper. And if you look at their paper, they were not in written in terms of minimize a function, which we optimizers are habituated to writing things in terms of minimization but wrote everything in terms of maximization. They also had non-negativity restrictions. They, the problem structure they wrote took, they are actually fit for economics. Mind you that Harold Kuhn was a professor of mathematical economics, though he started his life with a PhD in algebra. So that's how mathematical life is all about. So modern day convex optimization has a structure like this, where for the objective function and the inequality constants, differentiability assumptions are not required, while the equality constants has to be affine functions, which are differentiable anyway. Because without that, the feasible set won't become convex. So there is another kind of problems with special structures, semi-definite programming, about which most of you know now. I don't want to elaborate things that this x, x is a uh, set of n cross n. You know, first, you talk about set of n cross n symmetric matrices, and set, then you have the cone of positive semi definite matrices. Like, okay, of course, many of you uh, who are newcomers might not immediately realize that this is not a generalization of linear programming, but this is actually a convex programming problem. And you will understand optimization uh, much better if you know at the very outset that every convex programming problem can be written as minimization of a linear function over a convex set or, or, or with respect to convex constraints. So general format is also very, very restrict, very, very, very structured, where you have a function from Rn to R. This capital F is a function, say, from Rn to Rk, which is going in some u, and minus G, Gx is some Rn to Rm which is in some cone Q in RM and so and so forth. Those who are already into research in optimization would know these kind of structures. But if you want to look at a very general problem, what is the optimization problem? A constrained one. You minimize a function over a set C and that's it. So that's the key thing that you need to focus on. And then there is this very important format has a huge uh, important in economics, huge important in engineering, especially those in, in chemical engineering, those involved several processes. Uh, so this is called the bi-level programming problem, where you, on the upper level, you minimize, uh, this is, I've written, what, what I have written is called the optimistic bi-level problem. So you minimize a, a, cap, a function f, which is called the leader's function, subject to the fact that this y that you see comes from a solution set of a parametric optimization problem where x is held as a parameter. So these kind of problems with two structures, basically two optimization problems at two levels are, are actually important. It's more simplistic version is 
very simple. For example, you solve an optimization problem, a convex optimization problem, but you do not want any solution. That would be infinite solution. But you want which has the least norm. So basically then, among all the functions fx, all, all, the, solutions, all the solutions of this problem, minimize hx over gix less than zero, you are seeking an x which solves this problem at the same time, among all the solution, it has a minimum Euclidean norm. So my fx would be nothing but half norm x squared. So these kind of problems is called bi-level programming problem. And I myself have given a lot of energy in handling these two types of problems, both their Kuntar condition and also a writing algorithms. Then there's a standard MPCC format, which is done though, but, but it's very important to remember that this problem and the MPCC problem are not the same problem. So this is something which is already uh, known, I mean, in the sense that these are very standard formats. You see, whatever we have learned, this is the basic format. It will be same for everything. You can, everything can be written in this form. Or whatever you have seen just here, these are all single level problems. And suddenly you have this, this bi-level problems, which are different structures. So as more structures come in, your optimality condition structures are same. But optimizers, our brains are completely uh, focused on whatever optimality condition we do must have a KKT structure. So we are so kind of paranoid with KKT conditions that we need an optimality condition to be in the KKT structure. Even Karush Kuhn and Tucker wanted the optimality condition should be in the Lagrange multiplier rule structure. So everything goes back to the famous uh, Joseph Louis Lagrange, right? So. Now there is a toolkit. So here we want to cook something, for example. So we need the masalas and vegetables and whatever you rice and chapati, flour and everything. So this is the optimizer's toolkit. So what is a toolkit? Please forgive me for using the word toolkit. Toolkit is a normal word. Don't don't take any political connotations of it, because I, I have been. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, but I need to tell to my compatriots uh, in science in, in mathematics that in one talk i was brutally trolled actually this is a very sad thing but uh, this is a toolkit is a toolkit so it consists of the tools you needed to study you might be wondering suddenly i have put in all kinds of things so one hand you have differentiable functions other hand you have convex functions which are not differentiable or which the derivative is replaced by this set valued tool called the subdifferential. And if deriv if the function is non-convex, a first step is to go to something called uh, regular subdifferential, where you know that here fx minus fx bar is greater than, it cannot be just greater than vx minus x bar because the function is not convex. So this will not hold, but some error has to be there. So here is the intuition. You're moving from convex to non-convex, keeping almost the same structure, but add some error. So, then this thing can always become empty sometimes. Things can go wrong at several excess. While you can take its limiting version, that is, you can take a sequence of elements from here, which converges to some V, then that V uh, would actually belong to something which we call limiting subdifferentials. And then there is something called Clark subdifferential or Clark generalized gradient, which everybody knows and everybody writes uh, writes a lot of papers with. But Clark generalized gradient has a lot of difficulties because at various, for example, at, there are several functions where at all the points the Clark subdifferential has the same is is given by the same set, so it doesn't differentiate between an optimal point and a non-optimal point. That would never happen with the limiting subdifferential. If the function is convex, then the limiting subdifferential Clark, Clark and everything coincides with the convex subdifferential. If you talk about computability, then convex subdifferential is computational because of the exact calculus rules. You can do a lot of computations while it is not so easy thing to do with this or even with Clark subdifferential. Clark subdifferential to certain extent, in some simple cases you can, but not this one always. Just to compute the, say if you take a function f of x, y is mod of x minus mod of y. I invite you to just sit down and to compute the Murdochovic subdifferential at every point. I'm, I tell you that it is not just so simple. So you immediately see that 
suddenly the there is a rise in the storytelling level so more more unknown strange things are on the screen so this limb soup is is a is a symbol is a kind of set convergence which essentially tells you if i take any v here in the limiting sub differential there must be a sequence vk which must belong to the vk going to v and at the same time xk going to x bar such that every vk must belong to del del hat f of xk that's the meaning so so essentially it means graph closed that's it that's kind of this stuff the closure of the graph of this set valued map del hat f is this that that's the meaning essentially now there is a geometrical kit so what we are doing these are giving the major non smooth tools so there is analytic tool which is the sub differential which is which is the derivative another tools these tools are used to you know approximate the feasible region into a much better looking stuff around the minimizer local minimizer because that would allow me to handle the thing and also to help me in actually expressing optimality condition these geometric tools for example tangent cone and normal cone become a very important tool for expressing optimality conditions which i am sure a lot of you know so here there is a standard tangent cone the normal cone for convex set the regular normal cone where you see instead of zero here once convexity of c is stripped off we have some errors here but again this is not a very stable kind of set it can reduce to just being the is it trivial zero so we just have again the limiting procedure to get what is called a limiting normal cone some people call it mordokovic normal cone and but there is a lot of uh, controversy among optimizers whether it should be called mordokovic normal cone or not though i am a very good friend of boris and one's co-author but maybe i would um, i would love to call it mordokovic normal cone but there there are several people who says no nothing doing just call it limiting normal cone so there are a lot of issues that that all always happens in science and you do not know what are the inner issues uh, okay so the calculus rules calculus rules is just because your um, sub gradient sub differentials are imitating derivatives when derivative is actually absent they are playing the role of derivatives Uh, so it's some kind of a you can say proxy for derivatives at a non-differentiable point. So how does this proxy fellows behave? Do they maintain some kind of semblance with the derivative? And that's one of those. That is why we call the calculus. So it's non-smooth calculus. So what we learn in our standard calculus classes is smooth calculus. But now we talk about non-smooth calculus. There are several books which uh, deals with it very well for convex. I would. Uh, refer to hiriyatuluthi's book excellent hiriyatuluthi and lemarshel convex analysis and minimization algorithms volume 1 and 2 and if not uh, you can just take fundamentals of convex analysis by these two authors the after that you can also think of uh, uh, looking at several books by clark and some books by peno and also by two major massive volumes by boris mordokovic himself and then uh, along with this this is a very very crucial role this 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 is a qualification condition this kind of qualification condition appears even in economics when you are talking about economic equilibrium this kind of conditions come in these are qualification conditions this is exactly the qualification condition is a when if you have thought of it apna talk ta to khub sundor holo apni ki durgapur e naki ekhane hello uh, professor uh, please uh, unmute your mic माइनस that is a limiting normal cone of c1 intersection of the limiting normal cone of c2 at x they have only the trivial element zero which is the common element of course then this calculus this rule holds 
so this can be viewed from the rule of the sum rule but if you look at it very carefully this is actually a kind of mangasarian form of which constant qualification but those who have read optimization more deeply and had more experience would realize that this is actually the mfcq in this disguise so though we don't celebrate him nowadays olvi mangasarian's contribution to optimization and especially to the theory of optimality necessary and sufficient optimality conditions is far reaching actually because without that many many things which we want to have want want actually to progress with cannot take place right so once things are convex things are always good that's the meaning so that's what is called regularity convexity is a kind of regularity when the set has convex structure it gives you lot of nice information if we if you look at a local region of the set the set has all kinds of good stuff going on that's that's the key idea so what is here now to start with the main part i now invite you to the dinner to start with the dinner i had a drink you can choose your drink of course uh, whichever you want uh, which could be a fruit juice or a coke or anything else a hard one too so here we are going to talk about a basic see you know if i uh, talk about we'll see how this result actually gets used so you the basic basic problem was minimize effects subject to x element of x element of c intersection x okay so so that was the basic problem mean sorry minimize effect subject to x element of c now you add the drink which is x so it becomes minimize effects x element of c intersection x now see f is local ellipses and that's what it is then x if x bar is the local minimum of this problem then x bar is the local minimum of the problem f plus the indicator function of c intersection x and then this is the necessary optimality condition now because one of them is a local ellipses function the sum rule can work this sum rule will work because here f is local ellipses while g is lsc because if i take c to be because the set x c cross c intersection x is closed this is lower so the delta this delta function is lower semi continuous and hence you will get this optimality condition so additionally if you can have this condition true then you will have this to be replaced by the sum of these two so these are nothing but the lagrange multiplier parts come in here so that's very important to realize that lagrange multipliers actually are hidden in the structure of normal cones and this is a qualification condition which i told you is a mangasarian type from which constant qualification so what is x is rn that is when we have just c then what would happen if x is rn then uh, i would simply have this to be zero so at any point on the open set the normal cone is the zero vector so then it will give me the standard result right so now what if x is closed when do i have this intersection if i write c in terms of inequality constant x in terms of equality constants how do i prove that under what conditions i can i show that this intersection is zero that may not be so easy to answer so what i am trying to say is that the non smooth ideas actually for for example this should be del l i miss this the l here from there is a l here there should be l here and there should be l here limiting sub differential the limiting sub differential though may not be may be very difficult to compute but is a very good explanatory tool it tells you what really you have to do so such an answer might be partial and let us see what we can do in the convex case in the convex case how very silently this condition will get satisfied without any recourse uh, to this actual proving this right so let us take that as a main course 
of the dinner. So here we have a standard convex optimization problem where the feasible set F I have split into two. This part, the inequality constants are represented by C, equality affine constants are replaced, replaced by this. And here we write the general rockefeller shenichni condition and then we are asking what happens if this happens. When will this happen? How are we sure that such thing happens? And this is not so easy to prove. If I just say, okay, let uh, there be an X element, uh, there's an X which satisfies this, as well as satisfies the Slater type condition here, that is GI X statistically less than zero, then I can prove this to be true. Well, that will happen, but it is not so directly simple. It's not so, it, it, you cannot say it in one run that, okay, okay, immediately it's clear that this will happen. For that, you need to know the structure of the normal cone in terms of those GIs and in terms of the HIs. They would happen, actually. They would happen. And uh, But it's, again, a difficult job to know the structure of these conditions, structure of these. So that's the question I want to ask. Is the I want to ask the students whether they can figure out is the Slater condition same as this? And, I, and, I, and, I, and this is not so simple to prove if you just want to go for a direct proof of this. So I'm telling you that even in standard convex optimization problem, questions can be asked linking structures which can get you in trouble. So let us get into the main course. The route to get out of this is to use something which I've always cherished all my life as one of the favorite theorems, favorite theorems of the alternatives, the Gordon theorem of the alternative. The Gordon's theorem of the alternative says that if I have, say, m collection of convex functions, then if I have this two system and I have, a, let's say, a closed convex set x, doesn't matter, some convex set x. So look at the first system where I'm expecting to find an x which satisfies all these strict inequalities and that x must also have simultaneously belong to the set capital X. If this system has a solution, then the second one will not have a solution and vice versa. In the second one, I am looking for lambda i's such that all of them are not greater than or equal to zero, but uh, all of them are not equal to zero, but each of them are greater than or equal to zero, such that summation lambda i f i x is greater than or equal to zero for every x. If the uh, system one does not have a solution, the system two has. Both of them cannot have solutions at the same time. That is the meaning of the theorem of the alternative. One of them has a solution, but not both. So convex for a convex problem, first just let us consider inequality constant. Let us take the equality constants on the side. And let us assume that you take, I've, for, I've forgotten the equality constants. I've taken it on the side. I've just kept in mind this additional constants, x element of x. So, so, so this x, this inequality constant is now put into this set, x element of x. I am not bothering about the actual structure, that summation, well, that is hi x equal to 0. I don't want to bother. x is a convex set, and that's it. And it's closed because the hi's are affine functions, they're continuous functions, it's closed. So what's what I have now is a Slater condition, which I have already told you. So there are two recipes. And the same source means the Gordon's theorem. Here is the power of convexity. There are two recipes. For doing the same thing, to reach the same conclusion, there are two paths using the same tool. Right. So one is to use differentiability information that convex functions have differentiable, they have directional derivatives. Then you can actually show that this system has no solution where this D actually belongs to the Bulligan tangent cone, which I mentioned before. And again here, because these are all convex in D, you can apply the Gordon's alternative theorem. And that would lead you to a, a pair which will give you this for all D. Now, there's a trick by Hiriyadurthi and Lemarichel that you can, because this is nothing but a support function of del fx. This is all support function of the del gix. You can add this as a delta of the indicator function of the Bulligan tangent cone at x bar. 
That is, if d is not in dx bar, this will become infinity. So anyway, this will be satisfied. If d is in x bar, this will become zero. So for all d is x bar, d in tx x bar, this will hold. So now, if you apply the rule of the, uh, because if you just have observation, the delta, the indicator function of the Boolean tangent cone to capital X at small x bar, evaluated at d is nothing but the support function of the polar cone of the tangent cone evaluated at D. So I'll replace it with this one. So once I have everything support function is greater than or equal to zero, which means if you apply the support function calculus, you see so many things have now come in. We now have taken into a lot of information. Uh, so now you, now you can write that then you can easily show that zero must belong to lambda naught into this one, C1, and lambda uh, I into del GI plus the polar of this no is nothing but the, sorry, this will be X, uh, the normal cone, the standard normal cone that you know. And lambda is strictly bigger than zero, it's later hold. So this is the KKT condition. This is one way. Let us see. Now, now see, you see, you, we have actually separated. The H part and X part is separated when we have just these equality constants, affine constants, then it's written as ai, ajx minus bj, then we can write nxx in a very simple form. nxx then becomes a subspace. It is the image of A transpose, where A transpose is the matrix whose rows are a1, a2, dot, 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 am. So here again, here I have used differentiability information because we know that for finite functions, these are finite valued functions, directional derivative exists. Even if we don't bother our differentiability information, then we can still use just this fact that if X bar is a solution of the system, then this system cannot have a solution. Again, the Gordon's theorem comes to my help. Again, the Slater condition told, tells me that lambda naught is strictly greater than zero. Again, putting X equal to X bar here would give me the complementary slackness condition, which links the primal problem to the Lagrangian dual problem. Now, if you construct the Lagrangian, then it will immediately give me what is called the saddle point condition. And which means X bar from the top, this just this part, it will tell you that X bar is, is in the arg mean of, is arg mean of the function LX lambda bar, where X is element of capital X. So that would simply mean that I apply the rockefeller shenichny condition. That is computing the partial subdifferential of L with respect to only X and computed at X bar. So if you write down the subdifferential and use the sub and the differential of the Lagrangian and use the calculus rule, this is exactly what you will get. Because lambda bar, I, sorry, this lambda bar I, lambda bar I is fixed. Now, if X is equal to this, thereby by using simple basic linear algebra, you can prove that if x, obviously, if it's all affine constants, it can be written as ax equal to b, then nx x bar is image of a transpose. This is a very, very fundamental tool. You see, just by using the power of the Gordon's theorem, I have delinked the g's and h. I didn't really have to uh, figure out that they, these two sets are actually having only zero element. Now, once I have written this, and once I've written a transpose, you will immediately realize, so here I've computed NXX clearly, but you will at the same time realize that this must be the NX, M, and A, N, A. Look, look at this, this, where did I do? So this CNX, so you will immediately realize NXX is, I know that is nothing but image of A transpose. Hello? Hello. So somebody hello. is, uh, hello, uh, Professor Son, somebody is showing the, his slide. Um, kya ho gaya, Shah, Shah ji? Main to talk khatam nahi kiya. Hello. Hello. Megha. Hello. Megha is here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody is contributing. So he should stop the. Uh, sir, no, sir. Only Datta's slides are showing here. Oh, yeah. The slides have been shown. I don't so know. Maybe, can, you, can you see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, we can yes, see. Sir, we can see. Okay. Okay. Now it is okay. Okay. 
Okay. So you see now once because you know that the image of A transpose is the normal cone to this at any x, then you at any given x bar when Slater condition holds, you can immediately take an intuitive leap in the imagination and say that the normal cone to C at x bar once Slater condition holds consists of elements of this form. You see, just by actually writing down things with Gordon's theorem with either through that this uh, this way or the saddle point way you can through your intuition figure out what could be the structure of the normal cone when you just have inequality constant so that's what i want to tell graduate students that do rely sometimes on the intuition in mathematics intuition is very very important this is this is an absolute 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 requirement that you can take leaps in the imagination Later on, you can prove in more detail that yes, actually it is because that proof is involved. But you can once you have made a guess that this must be the structure of the normal cone because the basic structure is zero element of del fx plus the normal cone for c plus the normal cone for x. The so normal cone for x I know is this, and the normal cone for c is this. When you write image of a transpose means any element is of the form a transpose lambda, right? So that that is again the, comes as the Lagrange multiplier. So everything is so much linked. So you can immediately make a guess of the structure of the normal cone. So you can you, are, you can do normal cone computation, taking a clue from KKD conditions. So there's a huge link with geometry. Now, if you want the second helping of the main course, you can think of this as Lipschitz now. Once you have, but if I put here as Lipschitz h i x equal to zero as Lipschitz functions. Then actually writing the normal cone of that is, is not so simple. Okay. Now what happens is that here I can write you can you can prove this is this system does not have a solution, but these are up, upper Dini derivatives. And because every upper Dini derivative is lesser than the Clark generalized gradient, immediately you will get this does not have a is, is this system is inconsistent because this is convex in D. You can apply again the Gordon's theorem to get this and back to Clark's optimality condition. So I'm showing you several recipes. So Gordon's theorem is the main source by which you are making different recipes. Different recipes, same source, right? Now we come to the desert. Not, de not desert, desert means the last part, sweets. Now I change the problem a bit. You see, I'm just playing with it. As I told you, playing with optimality condition. Now I'll make f to be lower semi-continuous function. It can take plus infinity value. You will say, why? I say, okay, barrier function side. If suppose I want to minimize the log barrier function over given constraints, what will you do? So some part of the uh, constraints have gone into the barrier and some has remained as it is. The hard constraints has remained as it is. Soft constraints have gone into the barrier. So with the log barrier function, how will you? How, what is the optimality condition? So if you have this condition, then how will you proceed? Now, once you have made weak conditions, something strange, interesting thing comes in. You can now write a very weaker optimality condition or an approximate optimality condition, which will necessarily hold, and that would come through using what is called the proximal normal cone. I've not spoken about the proximal normal cone, which is, which falls among the class of regular normal cones, of course, because this is a O norm x minus x per term, but normal, uh, regular normal cones, even this is one of the, one of the classes of regular normal cones. So you can then define what is called the proximal sub differential and it has a form. And then in that case, you do not have an exact sum rule what, what you have an, is an approximate sum rule. But it's sometimes called fuzzy sum rule in the literature, but it has not nothing to do with fuzzy set or systems as such, because this, this is actually an approximate sum rule. So instead of, uh, when you compute the del P the at X naught of F1 plus F2, you don't get the sum, sum part, the right-hand side computing computed at X naught and X, at x, x not at these both f1 and f2, but at two points which are nearby x1 and x2. They are within some small ball. Given any epsilon, you will find some points in this ball and function values strictly less than this epsilon such that this happens. 
And once this happens, you can actually prove this kind of optimality condition, approximate optimality conditions. You see the game has completely veered. It is, and I have given a proof here. If somebody wants the slide, students, you can take it and even discuss with, with me. So this is oh, what you, eight you, eight you eight Yes. So please, uh, you share your slide with us on uh, through the mail only, so that we yeah, can yeah. share with everyone. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll just. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, so you, uh, so now you will see how that uh, approximate sum rule is applied very carefully, and you will get this. But now I have a recipe to try for you, a problem for students, even researchers can try. Now I make f to be Lipschitz then what would happen? You see, when HIs are smooth, I am actually, and if I additionally assume linearly independent, this at, at the point local, at the point of local minimizer, I can actually estimate the proximal normal cone. Using this idea, can I actually estimate the uh, limiting normal cone for when the set is given by set of all Xs at HGX equal to zero? That is left to you. And actually, you can do that. It's slightly involved, but actually you can do that and come to this very simple Lagrangian multiplier rule for non-smooth optimization just with equality differentiable constraint. And these kind of problems do appear a lot. Even when you study um, non-smooth analysis, you're doing real analysis, just normal analysis. When doing calculus for non-smooth sub things, these kind of things come up pretty often. Now, a little more desert, a little more sweets. So if you have local ellipses, and now you want to get a more tighter condition, then clock sub then clock sub differential because clock sub differential is larger than the Murdochovic sub differential or limiting sub differential. And clock sub differential may not always uh, tell you uh, when you differentiate between different points it can have at every point it can have the same stuff right the same value the, the, the same set but Murdochovic sub differential would never have it will be always non-empty for a Lipschitz function it will be a compact set it will be a, but it will need not be a con convex set again here you see once you want to get such a condition you have to apply chain rules so you apply chain rules and then you use the basic constant qualification. This basic constant qualification is exactly that normal cone to C1 X bar intersection minus normal cone to C2 X bar is does the zero, as contains only the zero element. The basic constant qualification is exactly that thing. So you will immediately understand from the optimality conditions that if I just take inequality constraints and then limiting normal cone is actually having elements of this form where lambda, so these are so all L, sorry, I have made a mistake. These are all L. So these are all limiting normal conditions have, my, um, all the limiting normal cone has all elements of this form. So that's interesting that the structure of the normal cone can be gained by, so is BCQ always holding for standard optimization problems? Can hold in most problems? No. For bi-level problems, it will always fail. I'm not here given the details because my time is up. I've taken more time. So um, I, I can actually add to the slide that fact that why for the bi-level problem it fails. I'll take a special bi-level problem where everything is convex, all the data is convex, but the problem overall is non-convex. But BCQ by, I will fail at every point. So that's a bad problem. And then there's a whole story of how to handle that. So that we, uh, maybe I'll write in more details if Professor Shom wants me to write up a story on this. But I hope you enjoyed this story and this is the end of the meal. Uh, and any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Datta for a nice right. uh, tour and uh, deep dis discussion and detailed history of the KKT condition that how KKT condition was constructed in present form? Oh, I, I, have, I have a sign of Harold Kuhn in my oh, office. Very nice, office. very nice. He told me, don't sell it off. I said, no, I'll not sell it off. <laughs> uh, somebody raised a hand. Hardeep, tell me. Good morning, sir. sir Good morning. We, sir, can we define Clark's differential without consider, considering F to be locally Lipschitz? 
yeah you can define you can define Sir, there's actually, a way of defining clock generalized gradient without they've been local ellipses but that's again more uh, complicated it, it it can be defined you will okay. see clocks old Sir, book in uh, on calculus of very application of non smooth analysis and uh, calculus of variations small book from sarang there there he, he has, does the definition rockefeller also had tried it but that's that that's very messy so nobody does that actually you you essentially come to limiting sub differential because of this okay so dr laha is here if he want to uh, ask something yeah yeah okay vivek okay yes hello uh, uh, hello uh, yes professor dakta that was a very nice talk as always and i Uh, you actually you made my work a bit easier because tomorrow i have a talk regarding the kkt conditions and it is always so uh, i have a, just want to ask that uh, how you will add the concept of convexificators to this meal because you have given a very nice meal and Uh, recently, a lot of work is, has been done on convexity. Yeah, filter. because I I know once I introduced long back as a postdoc student something called upper upper semi regular convexificator, and all these sub differentials are actually upper semi regular convexificators. So yeah, I think if I write up, I'll add something more. I, I'll have to think a bit more about that again, and I'll write up. I have not thought about non smooth analysis for a long time. I am doing completely different things, so yes. more into algorithms now. So. But uh, I think I'll do again. I, it's really fun to write it up again. Actually, right now I'm also following you on YouTube. Huh? You have some very YouTube. Oh. Yes, your lectures on YouTube. They, these are really fascinating and very motivating lectures. Thank you, Vivek. So you keep on <laughs> doing that for us. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Thank you, Shahuji. It's good, uh, good, you, good to see you. Nice After a year, nice last year we met in the conference physically. Yeah, yeah. I think we should again. I I don't know. Maybe we should. I could have still gone to Venaras. So yes, I, yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Laha. Other participant can directly contact to Professor Datta. Yeah. Yes. Because there Thank is. Thank you, sir. Because now I'll send you the notes. Okay, okay sir. Okay, okay from, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Over, so I hand over the next uh, for the next session to Professor Som. Thank you, Professor uh, Saku and Professor Joydeep Datta. Joydeep Datta for his very illuminating talk, uh, clearing the basics and everything, to, and then going to the higher level. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Devavrata Datta to take the chair for the next talk to be delivered by uh, Professor Sudil J. John from NIT Calicut. Professor, so I take leave uh, because I am now in Calcutta, my old city. So I'll just go out. I'll just take leave. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.